don't think God really needs our praise, but he certainly must delight when his sons and daughters share their hearts and their love and give him uh, thanks for so many gifts that he shares with us. We Catholics have many different ways of praise and worshiping our God. But the source and summit of our praise certainly is the worship of God in our Holy Eucharist, our Mass, where the bread and wine becomes the real presence of Jesus our Christ for us to consume, to be one with our God. For over 2,000 years, we've continued this ritual as Jesus taught us at the Last Supper to eat his body and drink his blood. Welcome to the Catholic Corner. I'm Monsignor Walter Nolan. My guest today is a very dear friend and a great priest and a man I admire in so many ways, Monsignor Sam Siriani. And he's the director of worship for our Diocese of Trenton. Teaches us a lot of things and whenever we come together to give praise and worship to God, he does an outstanding job in leading us. He's also the pastor of St. Robert Bellamy, one of our beautiful churches in Freehold, New Jersey. Monsignor Sam is going to share with us about the history of our Eucharist, our Mass, and explain how consuming the body and blood of Christ is a supernatural moment of holy communion with God. It's being one, not only with his presence, but one with his love. Monsignor Sam, great to be with you. It's good to be with you, too. God bless you. You know, our Office of Education, I know, is sponsoring a series of uh, faith formation lectures, talks, and invites. And you're, uh, I think, giving a talk on the historical development of the Mass. Yes. Well, that's a good way to start our conversation, I think. Uh, why, why is it important if someone asks you uh, that we Catholics especially understand the history of the Mass? Well, I believe that to understand why something's the way it is, whether it's a, a parish, a community, a country, even a family, you have to know the history because that explains so much of why they do what they do and who they are at that moment. Also, I believe that the, under, the study of history gives us a sense of hope for the future. Because as I always say, nothing ever, there's nothing new under the, under the sun. Just the names and places are changed to protect the guilty. <laughs> Can you give us a little insight then into that history, that, that, that background? Well, I, I think that the, uh, the history of the Mass reminds us that there's always been a development in Catholic worship within the, uh, the history of the church that uh, the Mass really has its roots as far back as the Jewish temple synagogue service, you know, of readings and psalms uh, to be adapted in time with a, a Eucharistic meal that in the beginning was held in a, in a house church, later to be uh, celebrated after the uh, Edict of Tolerance, uh, under Constantine, the gift of basilicas were given to the early church so that that would have a major impact on how uh, the Christian community would gather and worship. Understanding the, under, uh, the meaning of the Mass and its structure also gives us an understanding of the order of church, bishops, presbyters, priests, and deacons. So to know the history, to appreciate that development, I think also gives us, uh, uh, gives me an appreciation for, um, for the church itself. Now, historically, is that tied into the Old Testament, like the Passover ritual and the, and the, the whole... Uh, tradition, the says, tradition says that uh, Jesus, and at least in three of our Gospels, the Last Supper takes place at the Passover meal. John is a little different, but then again, John's written much later. So it is a, a, a very special meal. It's a meal uh, that uh, has been passed down to us for 2,000 years. You had mentioned for 2,000 years, the church has been faithful in doing this in memory of, of Jesus. And we, we celebrate the Mass on all levels, from basilicas and cathedrals to mission outposts to small parochial churches to, you know, during, even during military activity on the back 
uh, of a vehicle, you know, it, out in the, uh, on the front lines. The mass is being celebrated. And um, it's really uh, an amazing history. You know, when you, when you say that, it just brings memories back. As, as priests, we all have these memories of uh, places we've celebrated the Eucharist. And from being with, uh, with youngsters in sports and, you know, and, and their activities, to even uh, at times celebrating the, uh, the Mass with someone who is going to be dying soon. And, and how that whole life process really is wrapped around the source and summit of our, of our love of Christ. Tell you uh, explain a little bit more about the the Last Supper we call it. You know, at the uh, uh, when when the Lord uh, uh, celebrated that historical event, and um, how did we start calling it the Mass instead of something else? Well, really, the word Mass comes from the Latin "ite missae es," the Mass is ended, and uh, that uh, very much is part of how. Uh, many of us were dismissed. I think a lot of people don't realize that the end, the end of Mass is not, okay, it's time to leave. It's time to, you know, you can go home now. But it's an actual dismissal with a charge. You know, in the third edition, that charge is made even more um, pronounced with either go forth, the Mass is ended, or you go forth glorifying the Lord with your lives that we are to leave this place where we celebrated in word and in sacrament the presence of Christ and be Christ in the world. So it's a missionary dismissal. And, um, so we're being sent? We are being sent, and we are being sent to be Christ. And not just the priests. No, everybody. Yeah. I often say to my people, you know, when I celebrate Mass, please don't sound like, you know, it's like, oh, great, we get to leave, you know, sound like, thanks be to God, we're going forth to be Christ. Mm. Share with us a little bit about, uh, about the Lord gathering his disciples around the table. Uh, you know, I grew up at a time when uh, a lot of people were saying things like, well, you know, Mass is an obligation. If you don't feel like going, you don't have to go. And of course, that's... but. Really, it is God who summons us to the altar. It's God who, who, who calls us. If we look at Scripture, we see that Jesus did much of his catechesis at a table, you know, whether it was at the meal in, the, uh, in Simon's house, whether it was the meal at Peter's house. He was gathering people around a table. The night before he died, he gathered his apostles around the table to celebrate a sacred meal. And in that meal, he, he took bread and said the words, this is my body. He took the cup and he said, this is my blood. And with that, he established this new covenant that he would reestablish with the, the, his own death on the cross and said, I am with you until the end of time. And, and so the altar is an altar of sacrifice because we believe that each Mass is a, a commemoration and a, and a making present the Paschal sacrifice of Jesus' death and resurrection, but it's also a table for a sacred meal. It's both, sacred meal and sacrifice. And we gather around it because really that's what the Lord wants. You know, somebody once asked me, why we kiss the altar when we start Mass or end Mass. And I told them that for the priest, that's the sacred kiss, that we kiss the altar because that's the place where he gathered his apostles and, and said the words of taking and blessing and breaking and giving. But it's also the place that we celebrate where he was laid you know, in death. But we also celebrated that place where he rose back to the Father. So it's all of those moments coming together that, uh, that I said for a priest is very sacred. But I said, you know, I said, I don't kiss the altar or the priest don't kiss the altar for, for himself. I said, you know, he's really kissing it for everybody that's there so that we all are saying this is that sacredness. This is that source and, of, of blessing that we all want to share together. Tell me a little bit, uh, Monsignor, um, the scriptures that support our belief concerning the mass and the presence 
of Christ in the, in the bread and the wine? Well, there are many scripture readings. Uh, John is filled with them, especially the bread of life discourse. Uh, you know, my body is real food, my blood is real drink. But also, if we understand that throughout Scripture, God has called a people to himself. Yes, he called Abraham, but he promised Abraham, you will be a great people. Uh, just recently, we had the readings where God was very frustrated with, um, you know, the children of Israel out in the desert and told, you know, uh, Moses he was going to destroy them and he was going to make them, make a new nation out of him. And he kind of begged him off. He said, Lord, reconsider. Um, so God loves when his people come together. Yes, we can pray individually, but the scriptures remind us that it's always God gathering us and calling us. And that's because God works through his people. God works through his church. God is in his church. And, and therefore, we must always be mindful that our prayer to God is precious but when we stand shoulder to shoulder with our brothers and sisters, I, I always say God's eyes gleam with joy for he loves, he loves the sound of his children praying and worshiping. And we pray with each other and for each other, which is yes. a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, we, we, we know that the Eucharist, the Mass is, is not just the word that we proclaim or not just the bread and wine, that it's, 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 it's based around prayer and prayer through Christ to the Father. A lot of times now we, we uh, see that in my lifetime and, and yours, we went from Latin to English and other languages of their cultures and now some people want to say it in Latin and share the, those words. Um, what about the, the different languages that we've shared through the centuries and, uh, uh, and why? Well, the, the, the celebration of, of the Eucharist or the breaking of the bread, as it was called in uh, apostolic times, was always the celebration of, of the believing community. And so the language of the believing community would have been the language of, of the mass. So in the beginning, it was Greek and Aramaic, Hebrew. Uh, it becomes Latin later on, uh, um, around the third, fourth century, um, and uh, remained Latin, especially after the, you know, the Council of Trent, when part of the call for reform, that was the Protestant Reformation, called for the vernacular. And even though there were those within the church that would have liked to embrace the vernacular, that was not the time for us. And so it would take the Vatican Council to call for parts of the Mass to be uh, translated into the vernacular. Always with the understanding that there would be parts that remained Latin because we're still the Latin rite. But the popularity of celebrating not only the Mass, but all the sacraments in the vernacular, in the language that we pray, and that we understand where it was so well received that soon the mass was translated into a multitude of languages. Who, well, if I can say this, uh, who wrote the parts of the mass? I mean, we have the, we have the very beginning, you know, we kind of say, Lord, have mercy on us. And, and, and certainly some of those words are so beautiful, you know, that, it, that it's the healing of Christ. And I think... Uh, Pope Francis is trying to get that across to us more and more that that we're a healing people also and that uh, we bring that but then you know we have a, we have a creed in fact I'm smiling because a couple of weeks ago I I, I, I started the Apostles Creed and uh, everybody just stopped and I said oh, I'm sorry I'm on the wrong page and you know they brought a little laughter to them but we you know we do have the creed and uh, and some of the special prayers you know beginning prayers ending prayers uh, where do they come from well, just as Holy Scripture is a collection of writers, many of them we will never know, the same is true about the Mass. Many different authors participated in, in formulating each of those prayers. Uh, the Kyrie uh, being a litany that goes all the way back to the very beginning in Greek. And probably sung, is that true? And, oh, yeah, yeah, and sung. Yeah. In fact, uh, for about six years while I was at St. Robert's, we had the uh, uh, we hosted a Coptic 
which is the Egyptian uh, Christian uh, uh, church, Coptic Orthodox ch parish. And one day I was sitting in my office and it was a Saturday and they were offering the divine liturgy and I heard the Kyrie being chanted in a very Middle Eastern tone. Now growing up with it being chanted in the Gregorian uh, style and then also have hearing it in the Orthodox style, I was very moved to realize here was an ancient prayer, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, being preserved in a variety of styles that, that spoke of the culture and, and, and the lives of the people who worship. Uh, but some of the prayers were written by uh, our, our ancient popes. Um, some were developed by uh, the lived experience of the church. Uh, the Roman rite has always been known for its uh, simplicity and, and clarity. Uh, we're not much of uh, long prayers. And if you think of both the, um, the colic, the prayer over the gifts, and the prayer after communion, they're kind of short, right to the point, and uh, speak of the mystery that we will celebrate, are celebrating, and have celebrated. And, uh, and certainly some of these prayers have been, I guess I'll say, reformulated a little bit, uh, and they're also teaching prayers. Well, and, and I forgot to mention, like the creeds. Mm -hmm. Okay, now the Apostles' Creed, we're not too sure where that came from. I mean, it's an ancient prayer. Not the Apostles. Uh, no, I, I doubt it. But, but then again, in ancient times, if you wanted something to be respected, you kind of got a good author to whether they wrote it or not. But the Nicene Creed was crafted by a council, uh, and a very important council. And uh, even this past uh, weekend, or whenever I get together with my family, they kind of crucify me over the word uh, con consubstantial uh, and uh, why that word. And, and I believe that it is a word that has been crafted in the creed to remind us of the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people who, who admire Jesus Christ, but they don't, ad they don't recognize him as God. We proclaim him as God. And that is a theological reality and an act of faith that's very important. And so consubstantial is the word. And it's up to us to get used to it. Well, what I always feel, and I try to explain to people too, and to myself, you were dealing with a mystery. Oh, and, yeah. and to try to put into human words, I guess it was uh, Augustine who said, you know, uh, God is more unknowable than knowable to our, to our own human feelings and our own human expression. So to kind of put words that are about God, and when we talk about God as Trinity, into human language, it, it does almost create or, or offer to us a, a word that that we, we, we try to get to the substance of what's happening in that mystery as best we humanly can. And I think consubstantial is probably the best word that we could, we could, we could utilize to, to make that expression of, of the mystery of God, which, which is, uh, 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 and all of us, you know, end up saying, it's in faith, Lord, give us, the, give us that faith, you know. And uh, so uh, the liturgy has changed, though. I mean, you started off by, in our discussion, which I thought was so nice, to talk about how, in a sense, it started in house, in house masses or house churches or gathering of people in their homes. Yes. And then how it expanded through, uh, through the basilicas or whatever. How, does that, um, how has that liturgy changed uh, throughout the centuries? I mean, has there, has there been a change? In, and what hasn't changed in our liturgy? Well, I believe... Historically, the, um, the focus of, of really two liturgies uh, before the council, it would be the mass of the catechumen, mass of the faithful, and then after the council, we called it the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. Word and sacrament were always connected in, in some way. Um, the number of, of readings might have changed, uh, the number of prayers might have changed, but the celebration of the word was always used 
to prepare our hearts and minds to receive the sacrament. That became ever more clearer after the council when those uh, words uh, were placed into the vernacular and so we could uh, participate. Um, but that structure has been with us for, for at least two millennia. Uh, now, some of the other elements that has either grown or diminished over time, um, and, and, and therefore uh, there can be found uh, various changes. I, I think one of the elements of, uh, that the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy had called for that was then implemented in the period afterwards was to simplify the rituals so that the rituals stood out clearly and, uh, and not be overwhelmed with the, uh, the burden of history. For some, they miss those prayers. For others, such as myself, I appreciate the clarity and the simplicity of, of the offering you know, during the preparation of the gifts, uh, the clarity of the preface, and, and the variety given to us in Eucharistic prayers, which is an addition compared to the one we used to call the Roman Canon, which today is Eucharistic Prayer 1, which was our one Eucharistic prayer for over 400 years, and even longer. So I, I really think that... Uh, um, the mass has grown, you know, has developed. It continues to develop, and it will develop as we move into this third millennium. But the words of consecration always stand out for us. Have always been the same. You, you, you mentioned before a, a word that people kind of raise their eyebrows at: consubstantiation. I'm going to put another one out for you: transubstantiation. You know. What, you know, when we're talking about the elements of the bread and the wine, we as Catholics certainly believe that, that through the mystery of God and the grace of God, it becomes the body and blood of Jesus and stays the body and blood of Jesus. Yes. Some might call it a, that it signifies, but we say no, that it is. Yes. And uh, I know myself, uh, uh, when they try to get back to the actual words of Jesus, there's an awful lot of, uh, I think... Uh, education about uh, understanding that his, probably his words were the words of consecration, uh, that, that he did actually say, this my body, this my blood. Uh, now how, do we, how do we explain that to, to folks? And the language that we use does, I think, bring them into the mystery when we say that uh, the, uh, the real presence is, is brought about by transubstantiation. Can you explain that a little bit as best we possibly can to those who are listening to us? <laughs> well... I think it's important to realize that it is, um, the church has always believed in the true presence of Christ in the elements of bread and wine. Uh, again, knowing our history, knowing what uh, the patristic fathers have said, what ancient prayers uh, were written about, emphasize that Christ is truly present, that this is not just bread and wine, but this is the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Transubstantiation is a scholastic philosophical explanation of this miracle, this wonder uh, that takes place, that the substance that is bread, the substance that is wine is changed, not the external. It still looks like bread and wine, but the substance has, has changed, and that change is Christ. To our present um, generation with the worldview and the mindset that so many people have, there will have to be another way of, of communicating it. Although transubstantiation works for me, but we always need to re-announce the gospel and re-announce how Christ works with us and how Christ invites us into communion with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, sometimes it's important for us to remember that in the Mass, we are invited into communion with the tri triune God. You know, we give worship to God the Father 
in the name of Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that gathers us together. Even in the Eucharistic prayer, we ask the Father to allow us to be one in Christ so we can be one in the Holy Spirit. Some 50 years ago, a beautiful saint to be, John the 23rd, uh, convened a council that uh, certainly was uh, uh, world-changing in many, many ways, uh, Vatican Council II. Uh, can you talk to me a little bit, uh, Monsignor, about the bishops uh, that were there and uh, what changes were made to the liturgy at the time? I mean, that seemed to be a, a, a kind of specific point, and they spent a lot of time on the liturgy. Well, just as a historical note, at the last uh, session of the Council of Trent, 400 years before the opening of, of uh, or 400 years before the issuing of the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, the uh, Council Father said that the liturgy and the breviary, the office, should be reformed. And that's all they said. And then the you know, the church took over and, and did that reform. When you know your history, it then becomes quite moving to realize that at the Second Vatican Council, the first document to be issued, to be proclaimed by the council, was the liturgy, uh, uh, the Constitution on the Liturgy, issued December 4th, 1963. 400 years after, you know. And, and in that, again, the Council Fathers called for uh, a renewal of the liturgy, to hold on to what needed to be held on, to review each element and where there could be adaptation and change, allow it, but to make clear the face of Christ. And I think that has been the force of the and Council. And invites us also to be the face of Christ. Oh. I love what Augustine said one time, you know, receive that which you are. That's a very, very beautiful statement. Yes. Monsignor Sam, thank you so much for your prayer, your love, and especially your love for us guys too and <laughs> teaching us so well. The Catholic Corner, if you'd like to learn a little bit more, have any questions, please contact the Office of Worship, dioceseoftrenton.org. Allow the Eucharist to be an act of thanksgiving. Bless you and pray with us. Thank you.